Yo, thank you for joining us on Rebuilding the Beast. What's up, Alicia? Thank you for having me. I'm so excited. Your platform is so dope. So I really appreciate you having me on it. No, thank you for joining. You're, you already, she already shared your story with us um, on the page. But, and, and this is also why I have the, you know, I've privy to the information of your life of the different facets of your journey so far. You know, if you, if you went from, you know, a home that had some, some issues and troubles to moving from a black neighborhood to a white neighborhood, discovering basketball, you know, being the, the you know, a tall black woman in the school where they didn't know anything about that. So there's so many different facets to your story that I can't wait for us to get to. But um, maybe we could do a, a quick review of your story. Tell me about, you know, you know, because I think we look at the tall, confident, swag, <laughs> swagalicious. <laughs> but honestly, you know, we, you know, I live and look up to you. You know, I know a lot of women out there look up to you and we see you on Instagram. And we see this person and this persona. But Rebuilding the Beast as a podcast is about understanding people's stories, understanding that it didn't just come like this. You had to build it up through different events. And we are still a work in progress. We're never there. Absolutely. You know? I am a work in progress every single day. And I build off of the things that I have learned along the way. Every single thing that you go through is a building block. So from the moment I was born and the environment that I was born into to even something that I learned this morning when I woke up, like I'm constantly building myself. Mm, yeah. And so are you, every single one of us is. That's the, that's the whole point is that we all have our challenges that we're dealing with and it's part of taking us to where we're trying to go, right? Uh, this beast. So yeah, let's start off from, from home. You know, you, you grew up in a, in a kind of a tough home and, and dealing with and watching mom and dad go through a tough, you know, childhood. What was that like you watching that as a child? So I have amazing parents. Um, my mom and dad are amazing, beautiful people that have built me into the person that I am today, but they showed me what to do. And they also showed me things that I shouldn't do. And I think that we often forget that our parents are people just like we are. They are constantly building themselves. They are imperfect, just mm -hmm. like we are. And we hold parents to a really high standard, but we also have to understand that they're growing and learning just as we are along the way. And one of those people, uh, my dad, um, who I'm a daddy's girl through and through, um, he was so amazing. Um, he has now went to be with the Lord, but uh, he was an alcoholic for the first nine years of my life. As a matter of fact, I wear uh, one of his recovery chips that he got along the way um, because when I was nine years old, he entered into rehab and he did it for himself, which you, you have to do, right? You have to do it for yourself, but he also did it to become an amazing dad for me and my brother. I will never forget what he went through, um, but in those first nine years, I witnessed a lot of things that I shouldn't. Um, he was a far different person when he was on alcohol than he wasn't. And so there was a lot of things that I had to recover from and rebuild from after those first nine years of my life and the things that I witnessed uh, while he was sick, you know, because alcoholism is a sickness. So there was a lot of fighting <laughs> with my parents, uh, uh, a lot of, you know, my mom having to be strong for herself and for us. And eventually she had to be strong to the point of us leaving. So we moved from Portland, Oregon in a predominantly black neighborhood to Beaverton, Oregon, which super short distance away, but it was like day and night um, where I was like one of 30 kids in my school district that was of color. And so oh. I went from a space that was very, very loving and very, very cultivating of me as a black woman or a girl at the time to a space that literally hated every single thing about me um, down to the teachers. You know, my teachers is, were completely racist towards me. How far was this distance that you moved? I, I believe it's like nine to 12 miles. I mean, I don't know exactly, <laughs> but um, it, it was, and Nike is actually, um, and I'm a Nike girl, 
through and through, but in Beaverton and people think like, oh, well, this big company is there. And so it must be a progressive space. And while that space is progressive within Beaverton, um, Beaverton at the time, and it's, it's come quite a long ways, but at the time uh, it was not at all. I mean, my brother who still lives there goes through a lot still in that <laughs> neighborhood. Um, but at the time when I was young, you know, not really understanding why all of these people, these people hated me. Um, it was hard, you know, within the first couple of weeks of living there, I was walking home with my brother, um, you know, very young. Um, I was tall, so people probably didn't think I was as young as I was, but people yelled the N word out the windows at us as we walked home. That's, that's gotta be scarring for a child. Take me through what you're, what are you thinking? I, that's actually happened to me before. And I feel like I have a different relationship with that word because when the person called it to me, especially coming from Africa, I didn't really understand the significance of that. I mean, I knew it from the books, but it's like reading it versus actually feeling it in your bones. And I remember somebody calling me that when I was in this hick town in California. And I was like, what, what, why? You know, but what was your experience with that? So at the time when I heard the word for the first time, I knew that it was wrong because of the venom that came with it. Mm. Like the way, the direction of the word, I knew that it was wrong, but I didn't understand what it meant. And when I told my father what had happened, of course he was enraged. Um, I even think he, um, you know, my dad didn't play games. So uh, he brought some of his friends out to try and find who said it. Uh, Cause my dad, he, you know, he wasn't playing around, but uh, he had to explain to me what it meant, how the world worked, what the world thought of me as a black woman. Um, and it was a hard conversation that he had to have with someone who was so incredibly young, but it was one that opened my eyes to the world. And I'm so thankful to have had, e even though I wish I wouldn't have had that word in that ideal uh, thrown at me, but it really showed me how the world worked at an early age. And it helped me to cope with all of the things that were going to happen to me. I still went into a very dark place. Um, when you have a teacher call you a black bitch. <laughs> that, that part of it, no. I just, I couldn't even understand what I was reading when I read that part of your story. Yeah. When you have a PE teacher call you a black bitch because you challenge them on a softball call in PE. Like for those words to What's, come out What of grade mouth, is this? Man, so I started fourth grade when I went to Beaverton. So that had, by that time, I think it was in sixth grade when that happened. Yo, this is not high school. This is in sixth grade? Yeah, yeah. So when I was in fourth grade, when I started in Beaverton, um, in fourth grade, I had a teacher named Mrs. Bean. I used to call her Mrs. Mean. And she would bring me up in front of the class and tell my spelling scores on a regular basis and like how I was such a bad student and all of this. And I was the only kid in the class that she would do that to. And every single time my parents would go up, they would challenge it, she would deny it. And then finally, the kids started complaining, the other white kids in the class started complaining to their parents and they complained and that's when something was done about it. And it's funny because a lot of people say, well, why didn't your parents just take you out of that school? And I asked my dad that and he was like, well, you can't take yourself out of life. And this is the reality of it. Like if you keep taking yourself out of situations, you're never gonna learn and grow with them. And it's always gonna be that way because there's always going to be something that okay. is said about you someone who doesn't like you, someone who doesn't accept who you are. And it's true. It's true. I and, wonder and so, how, this, how this shaped you now and not running away from situations where you find yourself and you're like, man, I, I just got to deal with it and I got to confront it head on. Yeah. No, it's definitely translated into my life in so many ways. And to this very moment, I have to do that because I have to stand up for myself every single day in some way. Um, so we, you talked about going through some depressions and, and to be honest, very understandably. So when you hear of, of teachers saying to, this to you at a young age, 
when you hear kids being mean to you. Um, let's talk a little bit about, about bullying. And, yes. you know, unfortunately, bullying is still a, a tough part of our school experience for, for a lot of kids. Um, tell us about your experience. Um, you, you touched about the teachers saying what they did, but what about the, the part with your height? Was that a tough thing for you as a kid? Well, I've always been head and shoulders above the rest. Like I came out the womb tall, like I was 10, one, you know, 23 and a half inches long. Like I wasn't playing games. These jeans just came in strong. But um, when I went into middle school, I was six, three. So to give you some context of like how tall I was, I was a black girl, curly hair, six, three going into an all white school. And so they saw all of those things and said, Ooh, we're going to pick on every single one of them. So I remember there was a time where I was walking in the hallway, like just picture a middle school hallway with lockers on both sides that really, you know, cold floor that schools had yeah, yes. and yeah, um, linoleum or whatever it was. And I noticed a group, I'm like walking down. I noticed a group and one of them tripped me. And as I fell, another kid said timber on the way down. And that was the type of bullying that I had. It was verbal, but it was also physical. You know, I mean, I'm hitting the ground uh, and people laughing and that kind of thing. This is boys doing it to you, right? I'm assuming. Boys and girls. It, it was a group. Hmm. It was a group. And that's just one example Um and, and to this day, I get bullied for my height. You know, uh, being a tall woman is not something that people, it just blows people's minds and they don't know what to do with it. And they say crazy things to you or even come up and touch you. And um, like, oh, you really are that tall, you know, things of that nature. Uh, I have people all the time tell me like, why are you wearing heels? Uh, you shouldn't be wearing those. Um, so all of those messages still come at me to this day at my age, but like, because I now have the tools to say all of those are opinions, they're not fact. All of those are just people's misunderstanding coming out in mm. terrible, terrible ways. I yeah. have those tools, but at the time I didn't. And so I let all of those things get to me. So not only did I hate who I was as a black woman, but I also hated my height. Like I did not want to be tall. I, I just, I couldn't understand why I was giving these things that let people attack me for them. I, I feel yes. all that. I feel right. all that. as a tall and, kid, same thing here. Right. And people don't understand it. People don't understand it when people say that uh, being tall is something that is difficult. They're like, talk, what, what are you talking about? But it's just something that, I don't know, it's just fascinating to people, but it, people react to it in very different ways. And so at the time it really made me, it made me suicidal. You know, I planned my exit and thank God that he showed me the way, you know, God, the only reason why I am here today is because of God. Um, there was also, you know, in my experience, my brother, he was killed in a car accident uh, while I was in high school as well. And so I was already very, very low and to have something that tragic happen at that moment, it just made everything so much more intense. Yeah, and your and brother, I did not want to be here. Your brother, you said, was like your hero. He was that yes. was your guy, too. And so in the moment where you were low, but you still had something to hold on to, like this is my the person that makes me happy when I at least I come home to my safe haven. Yes, absolutely. And it was just so sudden. And it was, you know, he was in a drunk driving accident and he was, he went over a ravine and was ejected from the car. Um, and it was actually on all the news channels. It was on the cover of the paper. It was a lot. And so I kind of like, we saw that before we were even able to hold his hand in the hospital. And so it was, it was a really, really, really hard time. And by the grace of God, I'm here. Um, he's, he He's the only reason why I'm here, I guarantee it. So, and I'm very thankful for that because now I see that all of those hard times were there to build me into the person that I am today and to 
really pass on my story to other people who need it. Um, I really truly believe that we are here to tell our stories. And I'm so thankful that I'm able to turn these moments into moments of power now. That That's, I mean, this is the purpose of this. That's the purpose of this podcast. So we could talk about those stories. First off, I'm so sorry about your brother. That grief is something and loss is something that we, none of us, nobody knows how to deal with loss. I still don't. You know, I lost my uncle years ago and it almost shattered our whole family. That was my mom's closest brother and she's still not recovered till this day. How do, how do you deal with that? You know, to people out there, because this podcast is about sharing our stories, but it's also about explaining the, the lessons that you, that you learned along the way. How did you deal with that loss? What helped you move forward in a productive manner from, from that point? Well, I always say that I wish my brother was here, but the moment he died actually saved my life because, so as I said, alcoholism runs in my family. Um, a lot of family members, uh, like my grandmother, my dad's mother, she actually passed away from drinking too much. Um, so it, it runs in my family. And that day when I was in the hospital with my brother, holding his hand because uh, he saved a lot of lives that day. Uh, his organs were donated. And so he was on the machine to, to keep them going until they could uh, donate them. And so I'm in the room with him uh, holding his hand. And I vowed right there that I would never drink a drop of alcohol in my life. And I haven't. And the reason being is not because I think that, like, I don't know if I'd be an alcoholic or not, but I don't want to start so I'll never have to finish. And that's what I look at it as. And so I truly, truly believe that I could have gone either way in that moment. Like I could have been like, you know what, I'm going to go out and I'm just going to forget about all of this pain and, you know, take something for it or whatever. Cause there was part of my body that wanted to do that too. But I said, how, how can I honor him? and honor what he has done for me and honor my family and like all of the ways that they've had to struggle with this. And it was do not drink and I, and I won't, and I haven't. So that is a example of turning hard times into moments that propel you forward and make you a better person. Did you come to that on your own? Is that something, cause a lot of times when you go through grief, you get a counselor, you get a therapist, you, you go through medications. There's people handle it in different ways. How did you come to that point? Because that's, that's a very good thing for you to say, this person, I, I have to learn from the person who made a mistake or who, you know, so somebody that you love loses his life and you say, I wanna learn from him. How did you come to that point? Honestly, God, <laughs> I, I can't, I can't even tell you exactly how that came into my mind, but it was literally the moment when I'm sitting in there holding his hand and I've just never looked back. And I've been judged for that actually. Um, There have been so-called friends that have been in my life that think that my decision to abstain from alcohol is a judgment on them. And actually it's quite the opposite. I think you should do whatever you want to do. <laughs> That's just how I feel. I'm, I'm not here to judge anybody, but for me personally, it is a, has been a revolution in my life. And I still be out there having fun, you know. <laughs> just, <laughs> just in, just in the, uh, yeah, you can have fun without it. Yeah. You know, um, talk to me about basketball, you know, so as a tall person for me, like, I remember you talk about your height and the things that you had to go through being tall. One of the things that I had to go through was people telling me, man, I was an athlete at the time uh, when I was younger and people would always say to me, oh, you're just big for nothing. You said, you're a waste of height. Mm -hmm. They would say all these crazy things to me. And now if you look back and and people see me now, oh my God, you're so tall, this is great. But they didn't understand that the, the things I had to deal with. I used to hate my height. I used to think, man, this is terrible. Basketball helped a lot. 
it helped me with confidence. Tell me about your journey with basketball, because I, I think that, you know, that, that was another interesting thing, because you felt forced, right? You feel forced as a ball person. Yes. So I fought basketball for years. I mean, people would always try and get me on the court and do this. And I was like, no, I don't want that. I was modeling at the time. And I just, I wasn't really into basketball at all. And then there came a point where I realized that my family was not going to be able to pay for college. And it was going to be an avenue for me to build myself up in the future and go to college uh, you know, obviously you pay for it with your body and, and all the time that you put in, but go to college for free. And so while I had picked up a basketball when I was in seventh grade and like kind of messed around a little bit, I didn't really play organized basketball till the ninth grade. And so people just expected me to be balling out of control because they see this tall, you know, I was really skinny and lanky at the time though, didn't have a muscle in my body. But <laughs> they see a tall person, a tall black person. They're like, oh, man, that's a hooper. Oh. First person pick too, right? <laughs> oh, they, they was like, she about to she about to dunk. She about to be balling out of control. Like she's on our team, you know, fighting over me when I come to the gym. But it did not come easy to me. I was not naturally an athlete. I had to work incredibly hard. And so when they saw that I was really in progress with this game. Like it wasn't like she knew everything out the gate. I was judged. I was made fun of for that. Um, it almost made me want to quit. But then I said, you know, literally, I need to keep my focus on college. You know, I knew that I wanted to be one of the people in my family to get a degree. I knew that I wanted to use that to further my career in other ways. And so I just worked every single day at it. I mean, until I, you know, got the scholarship. And so, um, and wow. I was depression while I was doing that too. Um, all of those things. Um, and then my brother who passed away was a huge supporter of me in basketball because he played basketball too. He actually was also a ball boy for the Blazers at the time. And so he's like really into the whole sport. And so it really bonded us too. So when he passed away, it was one of the things that brought me a lot of sorrow because he wasn't there to share that with me as well. So I was battling all of those things and eventually I prevailed and got a scholarship to the University of the Pacific in Stockton, California. Well, yeah, so, I want to, before you, before you even go to that part, I want to, I really want to touch on the, cause you were way ahead of me in, in your, in your mindset. When you were this kid that people are bullying or people are making fun of, you were like, no, 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 like I got to focus on college. I didn't see college in the horizon. Like I thought I wanted to play in college, but nothing about my skill at the time said that this is a college basketball player, that he was going to be good enough to play in college. So how did you, how did you even get there? Well, college was my way out of all the bullying. It was my way out of the environment that I was in. It was, mm. it was out of all of those things. So that it wasn't even just like, I need to get to college. It was like, I need to get up out of here. Like this is this, we need to go from here. And, you know, what I want to tell people is you can have goals and depression at the same time. I think people think when you are depressed that you just can't see a light anywhere. And, and that's not always the case. Those are very much simultaneous in in our walks and in my walk for sure. Like I have at least a couple of days a month where I just can't see through the clouds. But at the end of the day, I know who I am and I know who God is. And that's what keeps me going and that's what pushes me through. So at the time I was completely depressed. There are moments of my high school years that I don't remember because I was so depressed that I was just getting through them. I, there are periods of time where people have to tell me, Alicia, remember this? And I'm like, I really don't remember being there. I don't because that is how depressed I was. But at the end of the day, like if you can, like to me, my point was, listen, I don't feel good, but I'm going to get out of here. <laughs> that was like my driving force. Like, I can't, I need to get through this. And that is what kept me going through those moments. So I, I would say it wasn't even about college. It was about getting up out of Beaverton in the bullying situation that I was in. This is, so, this is you as a high school student. I had a couple of days ago, um, I had a, a moment 
a couple of days ago where I'm just going through it. I just have a day, man. I'm not feeling good. I felt like I wasn't, I couldn't see this, this light at the end of the tunnel. And so um, just at that moment or that night, my friend texts me and she's like, yo, what's going on? How you doing? And I was like, man, really honestly, like, I, I feel like I don't know what my next move is supposed to be. I don't know how I can get to where I want to go. And she said something really cool. And she was like, yo, maybe you're not supposed to know. She said, I really understand where you're coming from. And I've been there a lot of times. Maybe your job is not to know what the next move is. Your job is just to keep making moves. Eventually you're going to be guided and move towards where you're trying to go. And I think a lot of times people that you talk about depression, how you feel like you can't have goals and depression at the same time. You can have goals still, and you can still keep doing things and accomplishing things while you're depressed, right? It, it was just, for me, it was just about, instead of looking at the 10 steps down the road, it was just like, what can I do right now in this moment? Sometimes that one step could just be closing my eyes, turning the phone off and just sitting there meditating for five minutes. Yep. So then I can see the next move after that. And, and I think that, you know, God asks us to move our feet, right? It's our job to move, but we have to give him space to do his work as well. Mm. And so when we are focused on the result and we're focused on where we think that we should go, we don't leave God the space to do what he does and to guide us and lead us because that is, is where it happens. That's where we find where we really need to be because he leads us there. And so when we're focused on our version of it and our painting of the picture, we don't leave him room to have the brush and put his strokes on there. So it's, it's tough to, it's hard to do that. It's hard to wait in expectation and faith. Uh, but Ooh. that's, that's exactly what you're doing. Tell me about, um, tell me about your faith. How did they even come into play? And um, yeah, it's, it's a huge motivating force for you in your life. Mm -hmm. um, from what I know, how, do, how did you, how did you learn about God? What, what brought you to him? Uh, my mom, definitely. Uh, she raised us um, in faith. Like, she raised us to know who God is. Uh, we went to church and all of those things. But one thing that my mom did that I think is like incredibly important uh, for any parent out there, I know that I pray to be a parent like this one day is, even though she gave us a foundation, she also gave us space to really figure out who we are and how we feel about God in, in our walk. She gave us space to discover uh, what it really means to us, um, or even if it's where we wanted to be. Um, and I think that's so important for anyone to do in life. Um, but, you know, she gave us that foundation and I know it to be true because I see it time and time again. I see how God comes through for me time and time again. Um, so the, the next stage in your career, your next stage in your bas basketball career is you go to college. And now this is where everything changes because you see confident women, to confident tall women. And this is, these are like, wow, like they are comfortable in their skins. Tell me about this experience and how it really helped you. Yeah, so people ask me all the time, how did you build your confidence? How did it happen? And we always think of it as being this like huge awakening, right? And really for me, it was just looking around and being like, hey, these girls like who they are. They, they actually like their height. And it was the first time that I really saw that it was okay to like it. You mm -hmm. know, my mom was tall, but it's like, and my dad was tall too, but those are your parents. Like they're supposed to love you. So when they, <laughs> right, it's supposed to love you. I'm not but saying they were all tall parents too. too. They were tall though. But so didn't you see how they carried their height? Yes and no, because I was a tall teen in my, in my world that I was in, you know, and I felt that for most of my day. So then when I would go home, like 
I, I was just trying to recover, to be honest with you. I wasn't even really taken in. I mean, I, I got my confidence in the way that I talked for my dad, you know, the confidence in, you know, different things from them that I acquired, but they didn't all come together and blossom until I had that awakening of like, I've been believing this lie that my height isn't a gift, that my hair isn't a gift, that my skin and my heritage was not a gift. I had been believing this lie from the environment that I was in. And when I looked around at these women that I was playing basketball with, I was like, they fine with it. Why can't I be fine with it? You know, it, and, and I know that seems so simple, but it was just a moment of clarity that like put all of these broken pieces, like they just started coming together. And I just started to own it. You know, I just started to own who I was. I, I blossomed over those five years because I redshirted, but I blossomed over those five years in- Redshirt. I feel you. If y'all don't know what redshirt is, it means your first year, what, was it your first year you did your redshirt? It was my first year because they was like, girl, you need to gain weight. Like, we don't know, <laughs> you're about to break in half. You. <laughs> You know what's funny, and I, I have a funny story that's <laughs> off to the side. So I have uh, my best friend. He took a visit. This is like my this is my my red shirt freshman year. So I'm in the weight room. I got to gain weight because I'm this lanky kid. I don't know what's going on. And him and his parents come to the gym, and they see me in there working out, struggling with I don't know how much little weight I had on back then, trying to do a pull up, couldn't do a pull up. And so they watched me in the weight room, and they were like, "Oh." Psh it'd be fine. He's actually playing my position and we were recruiting him to come to my school. And so the parents see me working in the weight room, like, nah, that's easy cake. You, you'd be fine here. You know? And, and as crazy as a couple of years later, they came back to, to watch us play. And they were like, yo, who is that? <laughs> who is that big dude? Is it and, him? Was yeah. He <laughs> okay. <laughs> I will tell y'all this, man, like uh, rebuilding the beast is a, it's a motto. It's a life thing because in my life, constantly starting over, I have seen where these little steps, you at, at the time when you're struggling with this weight, you don't see where it's gonna get you. And then all of a sudden they come back two years later, like what happened? It wasn't what, it didn't just happen. Every day I was in the gym and I was struggling, but I kept going. And eventually it was like, oh, damn, how did you, how can you do one arm pull-ups now? It was, I couldn't do what I wanted to do. So I started with the little steps. I had somebody holding my legs and that's kind of how it went. Is that how you saw your progress in, in college and your confidence grow as well? Right. And it's very much a, much a testament to, it's very much a testament to the fact that sometimes you will be planted. Mm. You will be planted. You will feel like you're buried, but you are planted because you're growing into that person. So for those two years that they didn't see you work, like, you probably felt like nobody saw the progress, but you really were blossoming into whatever it was you became, which obviously was a success in so many ways and it will continue to be. But during those moments, it's so important when you're under the soil because that's where all of the growth happens. You know, so it's, Okay, this it's, is why this is why I love Alicia right here. So this is this is the moment right here. All right, go ahead. Let me brace myself for the sermon no, that's coming but, right now because she always has these these hitters. This is great. Go ahead. But it's absolutely true that those are the most important moments in your life, but they're also some of the moments where you feel so alone, where you feel like nothing is happening, where you don't understand and you can't see around you to see like what's going on because you are planted, you know, but that is where the growth occurs. And that's where you really need to put in that work, even though you can't even see where it's going yeah. because it is forming you into what you need to be. Tell me about your, your, what, what achievement in, in basketball can you say sticks with you in your mind or what event in, in college sticks with you in your mind to where you felt like this is what this is what I saw. This was a model of, of what I wanted to be. And I strived to become this thing, this confident person. Because I always, I always think that having a role model is key. And so even if a role model is one of your peers. Well, honestly, it's those women 
that were on the team when I was a red shirt <laughs> trying to figure life out, just seeing how confident they were. Um, one girl stands out for show. It, her name is Shantae Guja. And I don't know if I'm supposed to say her name. I'll get permission before you put this out. <laughs> but uh, <laughs> um, she just, I don't, oh, I don't want to curse. She, um, she didn't give a dang. Like <laughs> she, she was who she was 24 seven. And I don't know, I've never really sat down with her to this day to ask her if that's how she felt inside. But from looking from the outside, she knew who she was. She didn't care who thought about who she was. And she just, she was one of those women for me that was just like, man, why can't I do that? Why do I feel this way about myself? Because I've been letting these people make me feel that way about myself. So it was the mo it wasn't even the moments on the court. Like, yes, you know, we could talk about games that were amazing and all of that. But it was really the moments in the locker room where I just was like in awe of like the way these women the felt about oh, themselves. Yeah. yeah, it was yeah. the way they were on campus or uh, just the way that they just really didn't care like about what people thought about them. It was insane. Like it was just the first time that I had really been around people that really loved who they were and exuded it. And I said, well, listen, I. I don't want to be over here feeling this way. I want to be over here. And so that's when the work began and it still continues because you, you have to constantly do that for yourself. And since then, I mean, like I said, we, you've grown into this, this woman now that is the person that a lot of people look up to like that, like you were looking up to those girls. Um, what achievement or achievements are you most proud of? Man, um, I'm proud of being an amazing aunt to my niece. Um, I'm, I'm super proud of that because, and I hope I'm, a, I'm actually on my way back home for some time um, for the holidays and, and such. I'm driving, by the way, not flying, but, uh, <laughs> uh, but I'm, I'm proud of that. Um, I'm proud of seeing her become into the girl that she's becoming. She's about to turn 16, which is crazy for me to say, but I'm, just, I'm really proud to be an influence in her life. Um, I'm proud of Tall Swag, uh, the platform that I have built, uh, because number one, I built it for my younger self. Uh, I thought about what did I need? What did that, that girl who was broken and didn't love herself need? And that is Tall Swag. Uh, it's a place to stand tall every day in every way. And I strive to be a person that shows people these things because I needed them. I needed them. I'm learning and growing every day. And I just, I want to help whoever needs it. And, and that's, I'm proud of that. Um, I'm also proud of myself for, you know, a couple of years ago, I had to stand up for myself and change my life. Uh, I, I was working in sports for some time and uh, I, was, I was in a place where I really needed to grow. Um, I was in a place of discomfort, um, both in environment, but also in growth. And God just said, hey, it's time for a change. And I made it like, nice. and that is imperative in our lives is to listen to when we need to change. And so I'm proud of myself for doing that because I could have sat in that discomfort and I didn't. So I, I'm really proud of you because um, for all of us, anybody who has been through any kind of pain or challenge, it's really tough for you to see outside your own situation. But you not only saw outside yours, you're trying to create something and you're, uh, you're already, you already have, but you've created something to help other people who are going through the same situation. You know, not all heroes wear capes. This is one of those situations where I'm really proud and, and you inspire me as well. That's the whole point of, of Rebuilding the Beast is imagine your younger self was about to go through the challenges that you went through. How do you advise them through it? How do you tell them your story to, tell, to, to help them through whatever it is they're about to go through and tell them it's going to be okay? You know? I think that I would just say that every single thing 
that people pick on you for is powerful. Mm. And that is why they do it. Every, every single thing. So from my race to my height, to anything that they picked on me for, they picked on me because it was powerful. So instead of looking at it as something that is terrible, look at it as a gift and it makes you who you are and it sets you apart from every other person because we're all different and we're all different in the ways that we should be different. And so instead of looking at that as a place of pain, look at it as a place of power and use those gifts to your fullest because you were given them for a reason. God gives us our gifts to make this world better. He absolutely does. Sorry to interrupt you. So based on this, what you just said, I think it's, it's really cool. So do you still notice that you're taller than many women? Does it, does it even bother you? Cause I notice myself, so people ask me that question all the time about my height and it, it went from, uh, I'll tell a story about high school. You know, I was the guy that everybody was making fun of. It's like, you're so tall. You don't do anything with it. And then when I started playing basketball, I was so terrible. Like, yo, you're so tall. You're horrible. This is doubly bad. And then as time went on, get, got better at basketball, but also got more confident with, with basketball, with success, whatever it is, it, you just get more confident when you get more disciplined, you put work into what you're into your craft. And I remember going to a wedding last year. I was a groomsman for one of my friends from high school back in Nigeria. And this is 15, 16, 17 years since I've seen some people, or maybe 16 years, because that's how long I've been gone. But they saw me and they were like, wow, like this was this height thing that I was so ashamed of back then was something that everybody was like clamoring for. They thought like it was this amazing thing. Even guys who used to make fun of me back then now said, wow, you're emasculating me. This thing that was my shame before was now my gift that people were looking at like, nah, I'm not, I'm not good enough now standing next to you. You know, does it bother you to be tall now? What is, how do you see your height now? Oh, I love it. I, I freaking love it. Like I <laughs> absolutely love being tall, but I will say this, I'm very much, I'm more vocal about the comments than I used to be. Because I do feel like when people make stupid comments, because they do, they make some dumb ones now, <laughs> stupid ones. Like when I stand next to a man and he said, you make me feel short. No, I don't. Like you feel short on your own. That's on you, bruh. Like for real. But <laughs> I will say that I have to look at those moments as teaching moments for people. And I try to be as gentle with my retorts as possible. I'm not saying always because I'm because <laughs> I'm still working on myself and God is still working on me. If you guys but, haven't seen it yet, y'all need to go on YouTube and go at <laughs> Alicia J's page. She actually has a, what, what did, what was it? Like the, the, the questions you ask tall people? The 10 things you should never say to a tall Ten. woman. <laughs> <laughs> it is amazingly hilarious. Sorry for interrupting you. No, no. Thank you for the plug because I need them, you know, watch hours on YouTube, like, please support. Yeah. But, but I look at them as teaching moments because I don't want these same people to say that to a 13 year old tall girl. Like I want them to be enlightened before they say something stupid to a girl who was in the same position I was in where a comment like that could make or break her. And so when people say some stupid stuff, I literally have to say back to them now, let me tell you why you shouldn't say that because of X, Y, and Z. Mm. Um, I mean, it's just amazing what comes out of people's mouths, you know? And thankfully I have the ability to be able to decipher that message. Like, oh, well you just really want to be tall. So you're saying that it's coming out like that. You know what I'm saying? Like I have the ability to have the tools to combat those types of messages, but I don't want them to say that to a tall girl who does not or a tall boy who does not. Mm -hmm. Um, 
And so, yeah, I'm vocal about that. To all the tall but, boys out there, for, for all the tall boys out there, we, we want to say thank you, too. Say, wait, what, why are we saying thank you just to the tall boys? What's, I said for all the tall boys. I'm talking oh, for all okay. the tall boys. Oh, sorry. My bad. We're saying thank you for, thank you for standing up for us because we need that voice that tells people, yo, please stop asking these crazy questions or please stop making these crazy comments. Uh, you know, it's there's a lot of kids out there who don't know how to deal with the fact that they're tall. They're so, you know, they're tall, lanky. They feel like they're awkward. They feel like they don't know if they belong or not. And they don't have these tools like we have now. So right. I appreciate the work that you're doing. Oh, thank you. I didn't mean to like come at you like that, but I just thought you was just thinking tall boys. And I'm like, we're here too. <laughs> we're here too. <laughs> see, hey, tall girls, you see, she got your back, even against tall Always. boys. <laughs> Always. <laughs> <laughs> um there was um there's something I also wanted to touch on. You know, um, you know, we, we talk about rebuilding, and there is also a chance to rebuild relationships. You talk about your dad, um, you talk about your dad and, and you know, growing up in a in a home that you that needed some work, you needed some help, and eventually um you re, you mended your relationship with your dad. You know, it became, you know, your best friend, your role model, everything. And he actually sobered up after you guys moved away. He was suffering with alcoholism and he sobered up. These are stories that I also want to tell because I think it's important for people to know that wherever they are right now, they can recover. They can rebuild yeah. relationships that have been broken. And, and so tell me, um, especially this important message for parents or children that feel like their relationships is, is tainted. Please talk to me about your relationship and how it evolved to, to where it was. And sadly, before he passed away. So uh, my dad, I, I had so many beautiful years with uh, the father that I absolutely love and who has made me very much along with my mother, who I am today. Um, my dad actually passed away nine years ago um, on the 23rd of this month, actually, uh, nine mm -hmm. years ago. And um, you know, from the moment I was nine years old to the moment that, and when he went into recovery, uh, to the moment that he passed away, he was a, a person who I looked to as had, he rebuilt himself. Like my dad literally rebuilt himself from the ground up. He went through I don't even want to know what rehab, you know, rehab is, is, is a really hard process. Um, and recovery for the rest of your life is a hard process to go through. And when I say he stood up for himself every day by not taking a drink, I will never forget the sacrifice that he made to become a better person for himself and for me and for my brother and for everybody else that was in his life. And he is a source of inspiration for me and will always be because it's hard to do that. It was also a huge lesson in forgiveness. Um, we are all imperfect people. We all make mistakes. And while you do have to forgive some people from afar, um, <laughs> forgiveness is, I'm just going to keep it real, but forgiveness is something that is very much for you as it is for the person that you forgive. You don't want to carry that around in your life. And he was a lesson in forgiveness because, and it wasn't even a question for me to forgive my dad because I love my dad. Um, even when he was sick, that was my daddy, you know, but it was a lesson in forgiveness that I carry with me because there will be things that people do to you that are not okay, but we have to remember that we're all imperfect and we do those things as well too. And so I, I wouldn't say I'm quick to forgive because there are some things that have taken me a while, um, some other things that have happened in my life that have taken me a while to forgive, but it's something that we all must do on a regular basis in order to become who we are. We cannot be our best selves when we are weighed down by unforgiveness. 
It's, so it's that is that um what's that analogy about holding? It's like the person who holds on to whatever angers and issues that people have have done to you. Um, it's like the man who holds on to hot coal, intending to throw it to somebody. Right, that's the idea of vengeance. You're holding on to hot coal and burning yourself while you're waiting for this right moment to throw it at somebody, but you're hurting yourself. And so that's how I've always thought about, about vengeance. Like forgiveness is hard, but you're not doing it for them. You're actually doing it for yourself to let go of this burden. Absolutely. On a, on a little, we're gonna switch gears a little bit. Let's talk about dating as a tall person. Mm, okay. <laughs> <laughs> This is the this is what I want to I want to know what what is this like for for tall women? I know what it's like as a tall guy. I know that there was a moment where it wasn't cool, then all of a sudden it kind of became cool to be this tall. Tall guys have always kind of been cool, but I think 6'11, which is what I am, is next level. And, and then dating, now I got to be careful because now if I date it, which I did, I dated a short girl and I got all the looks. Yeah, see, you see what I'm saying? No, I, I want to know looks. why. <laughs> now I want to know why. No, this is no shade to tall girls <laughs> at all. But what is it? What is it? Why Why y'all want to date shorties? Maybe I got to be careful what I say because I feel oh, okay. like people no. get canceled for everything. <laughs> <laughs> I was about to say, what kind of podcast are we talking about? But yeah, <laughs> maybe maybe short girls are, are scrappier, man. I ha actually had this one girl come up to me one time in the club. I don't know if I could. Well, oh, we, we're gonna be real because we're being vulnerable and open, honest, and whatnot on here. And um, she said something like, "I want to climb you like a tree, right?" And that worked. I, no, no, no. I'm not saying it oh, worked. Okay. I'm just trying to make an. I'm trying to give an example to say like. I feel like short girls are scrappier. They just, you know, they're in the game, right? They try to go get the ball. <laughs> oh, I see what you're saying. So you're talking, you're saying- Horrible analogy. I, I was gonna let it try and just slide. I was gonna let it just pass. I can't. Hey, we went from preaching on this podcast to- hey. <laughs> No, I mean, hey. and you're saying, what you're essentially saying is that they're more forward. See, so, I don't think that's true. I know for me, mm. I feel like I should be pursued by the person. Like, I, I feel like I should be pursued. I don't feel like, like I know who I am and I know what I bring to the table. And I want somebody who is equally on the same plane as me. And I'm not even talking about height here. And so mm. I feel like I should be approached. Yeah, this I agree with that. how I feel, yeah. No, I, to be honest, that was a joke. I, I, the, the short, tall thing, I, I really have never, I, I just see the people, right? And so, and I've dated different, you know, different yeah. heights and whatnot. But I remember this one time in college, I was dating a girl that was 5'1", right? And I remember we were walking down the street. Stop. All right. I already see where you're going. Stop. <laughs> I just logistically, like, it just... oh my God. Okay. It... <laughs> <laughs> um, but yeah, this is actually also why. So walking down the street one day, and um, this is in Nashville, and walking down the street, and this guy is asking everybody for money, right? He's a homeless guy asking everybody for money. And he got to us. He didn't even ask us for money. He was like, just perplexed, looking at us like, how does this even work? <laughs> and after that, yeah, we had to break up after that, because it was <laughs> Okay. Okay. So tell me, tell me about dating as a tall woman. What is that like? You know what? It is interesting. I I think that there are a lot of people who are very intimidated by the height off top, and so it's like you really can't even get to know someone because they can't get past the fact that you're taller than them or that you're as tall as them because they're not used to dating women who are tall as tall as they are. Um, but to be honest, I think that for me, dating is interesting because not only am I tall, but I'm also like waiting for my husband. So I really think that I, I, I personally, my personal view is that sex should be happen within marriage. And so I'm waiting for my husband as well. And that also adds another layer to dating. 
um, especially if someone knows my story before they get to know me, it's like they already have this preconceived ideal of who I am, which is always wrong. So I don't know, there's just a lot of different, I guess I would say, sifters when it comes to dating, because it's very easy to see who is there to get to know me as a person and pursue me as a person rather than, oh, it's because she's tall, or I don't know if I can wait, or I can do this or whatever. It's very easy early to see that if somebody knows my story. So it's, it's just another way for me to like, see who's there for me and who isn't. Wait, you know? so, so if somebody's there for you for your height, and, and back up for a second. And when you say you're waiting, it means you're you're telling us and you're saying that you're a virgin. Yes. Yes, okay. I am. Mm -hmm. um, I feel like we have we need a whole nother show to to break. I this mean, down. we can. So, but yeah. <laughs> <laughs> this is why I love you and how open you are. Have you ever dated shorter? Let's start there. The shortest man that I've dated is six three. And, and he you're how was tall? I'm six six. Okay. And I and I rock heels. So, I mean, that's just part of it too. But like, as every tall woman should if she wants to, side note. But literally, he was intimidated, you know, like didn't even like want to hold hands in public ultimately. So it's it's hard because there are people that don't care. And that's fine. There are people that care a lot and you you find off right off top and there are people that just won't talk to you because you're you are tall so and i'm talking about tall and shorter men like both like they're just they just can't wrap their head around the fact that you're tall like it's it's just it's hard for them because society tells us that women shouldn't be taller than men like it, it's just a thing that is just the truth and so wait wait a minute now when you worked for you worked for the warriors when i was there and I remember you being like the catch, like everybody was like, yo, like that's the, that's Leisha. Like, and I remember like hearing stuff about like guys hitting on you all the time and you were like, no, 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 I'm cool. Well, let me tell you a big reason for that is being a woman in sports is very, very hard. We are judged off top as coming in as being like, we're trying to get us a player and doing all this. And we are scrutinized straight up and down. So, mm -hmm. I was visual within the arena. I was visual. Uh, and, and personally, I'm gonna, I'm gonna be honest with you. I feel like we should be able to be friends with players and interact with players just as the men are because they do it freely. <laughs> you know, I mean, they fraternize all the time and women should be able to do the same thing because number one, we're grown. And number two, we can be friends just like anybody else can. And I actually did have, uh, I had, I still to this day have, for, I'm, we're friends, you know, from working in the NBA. But when you are a woman working in that field, you just have to really, and, and to be honest, I feel like I was too careful looking back, but you, you do, mm. like you have to protect it because all of these eyes are on you. I mean, I straight up was told when I started working in sports that I had like, you better watch out because people are like you, you're like, not, I'm not talking about myself or pumping myself up, but like, you're attractive, you're this, you're that. And so people have eyes on you like straight For up. Sure. Yeah. So it wasn't that. And also I want to, I also want to point out that I'm very confident, but I'm also a shy person <laughs> Like okay. when it comes no. to stuff like no, 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 I am. I do have like, I have these moments of shyness and like, sometimes I just be shy. Like, I'm just going to be honest with you. However, when people said that they would get at me, whatever, and that kind of thing, it really was a lot of it was because I am a woman working in sports and, mm -hmm. and you're just looked at differently. You are. I'm, yes. So you're, you're absolutely right. I, um, I think, yeah, dating in sports is, um, while well, working in sports, especially for women, um, it, it's tough. I know that we had all these rules. Cheerleaders can fraternize. As a matter of fact, anybody working on, anybody Dancer. working on the business side, dance, huh, dancers? They're not cheerleaders. Oh, they weren't cheerleaders? No. Oh. They're dance teams, like the Warriors dance team. What's the difference? Well, 
I don't know what the specific difference is, but I'm saying that is how they refer to themselves. Oh, and, okay. I apologize yeah. if I, you know, I apologize. No, I, listen, no shade Warriors. to cheerleaders, but I'm just telling you that is what I worked. I worked with the entertainment team, so I'm protective over them. She but was the boss over there. No, no, and, no, no. no. <laughs> <laughs> and then um, another thing I also want to talk about is, you know, you recently decided to go on your own path to make you know, to make your own company, to, to do your own thing. Tell me about that and that rebuilding process and, and what you're hoping to achieve. Whew, well, Ooh. I, I'm still very much in it. Yes. Uh, uh, my life completely changed when I resigned from my job. Um, I had been with the Warriors for 13 seasons and it came to a point where I had to stand up for myself in more ways than one. And I resigned and it was a very scary, scary thing to do. You know, it was very much a God thing. God showed me that I needed to do it because I had prayed for about six years prior to that. Like, Lord, should I make a move? Should I do this? Like, should I stay in this environment? Like, what should I do? Like, and he finally said, it's time, you know? And I'm, I'm so thankful that I didn't do it early. Um, I didn't want to get in front of God. Uh, I, I always want him to lead. So, but when he told me that it was time, everything in my body did not want to do it. Like I wanted to stay in that uncomfortable comfort that I was in. Um, Cause that really is a thing. Like we can be uncomfortable, but it's what we know. And so we want to stay there. And um, I have grown so much in these last two years. It has been so incredibly formative. I feel like I'm just beginning in so many ways. Everything is exciting, fresh and new. Um, I'm doing tall swag um, at a rate that I've never been able to do that before. And even COVID, even though it like stopped me from doing a lot of my speaking engagements about confidence and loving yourself, um, it also introduced a whole nother thing, um, a whole new fresh, you know, look at what I do and what I want to do. Mm. Um, so I, I'm writing now. Um, I actually just got, I can't say who it's with, but I just got my contract for my literary agent today. So yes, congratulations. That. And and it took a long time, y'all. Like, so you're going to be waiting for a minute, but the beauty of the wait, the beauty of the things that you learn in the wait, that is where the living really occurs and where you become who you are and who you need to be. And so you know, and then I'll be wait. Once I sign this, I'll be waiting for somebody to pick up my book. And then once I get that, then I will be writing and waiting for it to come out. Like we're always going to be in a powerful wait and we need to explore what that is and, and really do the work during those moments. Um, People but I have some other things too. I don't think people understand that the reward that you get for the battle you just beat is the next battle. Yes. And, and we don't understand that, you know, all these life experiences are actually, it's not like you beat them and then that's it. Like life is over now. Because if you had no more challenges, then what else is there, right? Life is right. about succeeding through these challenges. Through your experience, now you get to meet these things head on. Sorry, you were telling me about the more about the other things you're working on, superstar. Right. Talk to me. Well, there are some things I I really just can't talk about yet, um, but they're in the works. They're really exciting. They're things that I've been working for the whole time that I've been doing tall swag. So, but I do have a project coming out that I have not talked about yet. So I will be talk to you about it first. Um, so on November 30th, I am turning 40. And uh, I am. How is that? <laughs> Black don't crack at all, y'all. It does not. Wait, what? Oh, Lord, thank you for the jeans. Thank Man, you. really though. Yes. Um, no, so I'm turning 40. And so I will be a 40 year old virgin. Okay. And I was Remake. thinking about well, yes, that actually should be remade in the correct way because society paints virgins as like something that they are not. We are not awkward people who are not sexual. We are actually vibrant, beautiful people who just want to have sex and a lot of it within marriage. It's very simple. 
So like, and, and thank I you just- for that. Thank you for that. I feel like that clip right there, amazing. Thank you. But it's very simple. And so when I thought about my weight that I've had and continue to have, cause there's no husband around here. So when I thought about the weight that I had and continue to have, I really wanted to celebrate waiting with everybody on this day. So on my birthday, I will be releasing a book of reflections about waiting called Worth the Wait, The Beauty in Between. And it's a, it's a visual. So um, there are 12 photos of, of me and like various emotions and, and everything in my life. And then also coupled by these reflections about waiting. So not just waiting for marriage, but just waiting in general. Cause like we said, we're all in this weight of something and we can either use the weight or let the weight use us. And I have learned, especially over these last two years about how powerful and how beautiful waiting is. And so I just want to share it with everyone. And so that will be coming out on my birthday, November 30th. Okay. Happy birthday in, in, in the future here in a few days. Um, wow, I definitely did not expect that. I thought you were way younger than me too. So black really does not crack. Hey, um, I'm thank you. Yeah. <laughs> thank you for sharing your whole story with me. And, and I know there's so much more to talk about. And hopefully in the future, you, we could talk about more. We could talk about what this building process looked like and how, you know, because I, I could sense success coming you know, through all these things. And I know the struggle is tough. That's what this, this thing is about. It's we're all going through our different struggles, but good times are coming through your powerful weight. Like you just said. Thank you. I I'm so excited for what's coming, but I'm also excited for every single success that I have every day because we all accomplish something. I don't care if it's just getting up every day. I don't care if it's a new lesson that you learn there are so many moments of success on the way to the success that we're working for that we need to celebrate. Hmm. Um, life isn't a straight line at all. And even when, even with being happy with your life, you still face challenges. Mm -hmm. How do you keep your confidence in that positive outlook on life? We will end with this, with this great question. I keep confidence in God. That, that, is, that is all I can say is that when I have my eyes fixed on him, everything else is going to be okay because he ultimately works everything for our good. But I will also want, what I wanna tell people is you're not always going to feel great. Like there are days where I just do not feel good. There are days when I'm like, listen, I know it's gonna be okay, but the way I feel right now, I don't feel good about it at all, <laughs> you know? And, and I think that we need to normalize the fact that when we are in our journeys, it's not always going to feel okay, but it will be all right. Like, it's going to be all right. Like, it doesn't, it, but it doesn't always feel good because I think everyone thinks like you're just frolicking on the way to success. And that's not the case. Like, there are going to be days when you don't feel good, but you just have to push through because even though you don't feel good, those days are conditioning you for something as well. It's I always wonder though, I always wonder about that, that bad feeling, that upset feeling, whatever it is. I always wonder if it's supposed to be your motivator or if it's the thing that's supposed to redirect you. Like if your spirit is saying you're not in the right place, you know, but it can work. They can, they can work together. It could be the thing that's telling you, you're not at the place you're supposed to be. Keep moving. I yeah. go to where you're supposed to be. And that's kind of how I look at these, at these tough moments and the, the challenges that you're going through. Is that how you, how do you look at those? How do you look at your, your down moments now? After everything that you've been through, how do you see those, those challenges? I actually see them as essential because mm -hmm. like you said, they can be a director, they can be a motivator, whatever. I think they're all of those things. I think emotions are all of those things. Mm -hmm. um, if I, for example, wasn't uncomfortable where I was in my position um, that I left, I wouldn't have left. And I would have been out of alignment because I'm supposed to be pursuing all of these things. 
I'm supposed to be using that time that I was using to build someone else's dream for mine. And that doesn't mean that I won't come into an opportunity that I should be in as well. Like that I won't ever work for somebody else. Yes, I will. Like I work with and for people all the time, but that specific position was not serving me. And so the fact that that I had that discomfort that was very uncomfortable to push me out of there, it was essential. And it, it was essential and it was part of my path. Mm -hmm. So I think that we just need to look at what happens to us in a way that builds us rather than detracts from who we are. Mm. Like, d like, am I, I would love to have my brother here on this earth. Okay. But since he is not, I'm going to use that experience. I'm going to use that experience to become a better me and to honor who he was. And I strive to do that every day. And I think you should look at every situation like that. I'm not saying you don't feel the feels because you do <laughs> feel them. Like I sit and talk with my feelings and I talk to God like that too. Like, what are you doing, Lord? I don't understand. So I'm not saying that you don't challenge the feelings or feel them, sit with them, talk to them, do that. But ultimately use them for power in your path. It's uh, that is the motto, and that is actually what this rebuilding the beast is about. Is that we have tough things that happen to us, but you don't stop because of these tough things. You don't stop. You have to rebuild yourself, but you can still be a better person. You can still be a more successful person. You can still be the the kinder person, even with all these hurts. And there's so many people and you're absolutely one of them. Thank you so much for sharing your story with me, Alicia. This is, this is so great. And thank you for doing which, and I appreciate that so much, but thank you for doing what you're doing because you could just, you know, work on yourself as you are, which is amazing, but you're choosing to be intentional with your messaging and you're choosing to show people the good, the bad, the ugly, all of it because you want to help them rebuild themselves. And that that's a beautiful thing. And I that's just, purpose. That's purpose. This is using your pain for a purpose. And sometimes you just think like, yo, what is the point of all this? Well, why, why do we go through the things we go through, the good, the bad? And imagine if you can use your, your, your bad moments, your tough moments to help somebody else. Man, that is really fulfilling to me. So thank you again. I appreciate you. Um, man, this was, there was a lot. You unpacked a lot right there. You taught us a lot. Well, <laughs> you, you led us through that. So that was really good. Like, <laughs> I'm excited to hear we, it. We're going to have to do another one. This is, it's going to be a dating tutorial. So you can teach us, you can, you can explain us. Listen, I don't, I'm probably not the person to give a tutorial, but I can give you my experiences. Yes. <laughs> um, but actually that conversation would be dope to have with like multiple different people in the mm -hmm. space. That would be dope. Okay. All right. There you go. We're going to have a rebuilding, rebuilding the dating scene, especially with Corona and everything. I don't know how people are dating right now. I really don't either, actually. So. All right. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Leash. I appreciate you so much. I'm a, I'll hit you soon. Okay. We can continue our conversations. I always appreciate you, you know, building me up too. I always learn from you, man. Thank you. No, thank you. Of course. <laughs> I will talk soon. Bye.